Fundamentals Test 4. Uh, not too complicated, but you may or may not know these numbers. Now you guys better, uh, you better be prepared to dig into those books because you're going to be doing open book tests on your books at the end of the term. You're going to have to look these answers up. And probably no two people in here will have any of the same questions on their tests, right? All right. Number one, using compressed air and an air gun, what is the maximum allowable pressure? You basically are trying to protect yourself from being damaged by a lot of air hitting your skin and getting air bubbles in your blood. Because if you know if you've got a, a pump of any kind that loses its prime, what does it do? What does it do? What does it do? What does a pump do when it loses its prime? Anybody know? It quits pumping. Okay, now can you think of a very significant pump that you've got in your chest that pumps and doesn't need to lose its prime? Your heart. So if air bubbles get to your heart, your heart loses its prime, and then blood stops moving, and then you you die. You know, it's just so that's one of the reasons that you're not supposed to have more than 30 psi of air on an air gun. Now a lot of shops have got more air than that, but an air gun is not something you need to play with if you you know blowing around on people and all that kind of stuff with air. You know, don't point an air gun at somebody else. You know, consider it. Uh, something that's dangerous if you do use it wrong. It's really good for drying stuff off. Which air impact drive size is the most commonly used? What, which size impact wrench is the most commonly used? Half inch. Half inch, but that's a good answer. But if you go, we'll see more and more people uh, using three eighths and quarter inch impact wrenches. Uh, I got a quarter inch impact wrench in there. Uh, that whenever you're doing a lot of stuff that's got to do really quick on little, with little small nuts and bolts, that quarter inch impact winch is really, really handy on that. Um, what type of socket should be used with an air impact wrench? A, black, B, chrome, C, 12 point, D, either A or B. Uh, black. The black one is, called, is malleable steel and it can actually take the impact wrench. You know, you see a lot of people putting chrome sockets on impact wrenches all over the place, but uh, there is a chance that they could explode, you know, and bust. And if you ever seen anything uh, like that happen, you know, I, I tell this story sometimes about how I had a piece of something in a press, and I was pressing it, and there was a piece that uh, it was, you know, having a hard time moving, and a piece jumped, popped off of the thing I was pressing, and hit me in the shoulder, and it went through my shirt and into my shoulder, and it's still there. <laughs> it's a little, it was like a bullet. And yeah, those impact wrenches can do the same thing. Now you guys know the difference between a wiggle socket for an impact wrench and a wiggle socket for a regular extension. You ever seen the difference? The, the wiggle socket for an impact wrench is a constant velocity joint. You know when you bend an impact wrench, I mean when you bend a wiggler that you put on a regular uh, socket, it's going to go get hard and easy and hard and easy and hard and easy. Well, the imp I mean uh, that's the same reason also they use constant velocity joints on front wheel drive. Uh, half shafts because the wheels have got to turn really sharp and they don't want you feeling all that hard and easy stuff while you're turning. And so constant velocity joints always pull with the same uh, force and speed whenever they're, no matter how sharp they're bent. And you've seen impact sock, impact uh, wigglers, you just didn't know you were looking at them probably. That's those black ones that have a little ball at the base of the place where you put the socket. And I got some out there I'll show you uh, if you want to see them. But what can be used to cover the jaws of a vise to help protect whatever you're holding? Wood, copper, aluminum, or what? You ever messed anything up using a vise? Huh? What did you mess up? Oh. Yeah, you just ruined it, don't you? If, you? if you pinch it too tight, you just mess it up. So you, any of these other things, they make, you can fix your little jaws. They have little... Uh, protectors you can buy, you know, you can actually build you some out of something softer than whatever it is you're squeezing. Also, this is something else. If you're squeezing something like the body, like the body of a starter, if you put the whole starter in there and you start tightening it up, you may egg shape that thing, so be careful. Here's something else you might not know. Uh, you know, you got these here. If you got any kind of a bushing or a sleeve, particularly if it's a big one, and it's going to look like this. It's going to be a cylindrical shaped thing. Like that, and you know, if you just basically got all the way through, it's a hollow all the way through. And like some of these heavy equipment use big bronze bushings. If you lay those things down sideways instead of standing them up, 
just the weight of them laying there and gravity will cause that thing to get egg shaped. So you got to kind of be careful about that sort of thing too. Now you would never think it because it's metal, but it will. It'll egg shape it. And uh, the old 396 uh, Chevrolet big block, they used to say that if you laid the crankshaft on the floor wrong, it would warp it. <laughs> you know, that was pretty amazing, wasn't it? But um, I don't know why that particular one was any different, but I used to hear them say that. Did it really warp it? Or uh, it? Well, the people that were uh, Chevy nuts would stand it up instead of laying it down, you know, to make sure. And if you ever go to a machine shop, where they do a lot of machine work, like pilchers over there, you're going to see the crankshaft standing up. You don't see them laying down, typically. Uh, now, sometimes if you get one shipped to you in a box, it may be laying on some foam or something. But, you know, it's just basically what you got to think about if you think about, well, it's like a chrome and black sockets. This is not likely to cause any problem. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But you got what you got to do is you got to think past what might happen. If something does happen, how serious will it be? All right. How many of you know that it's uh, a bad practice to uh, have a gas can in the back of your pickup truck and get up there and be putting gas in that gas can with the gas pump? Now what happens there? What can happen? You might get away with it several times, a lot of times. But static electricity. When you're putting that, getting ready to put that gas in there, you got all those fumes in that can, and you go to take your gas nozzle, put over and one little static electricity spark, pop, poof, and everything goes up in flames. That has happened before at some gas stations that I know about. Somebody will climb up the back of their truck to fill up a, a uh, gas can, and poof, all of a sudden it goes up in fire. You know, somebody got to put the fire out, and by the time you get a gasoline fire put out that's you know burning your skin, it's pretty nasty. Um, and that's really painful too. Have you ever been burned like that? You ever been burned? You ever burned like that where you got burned by gas or something? Oh, yeah. That's nasty. <laughs> yeah, well, that, you had that the other day. <laughs> but that wasn't gasoline. That was propane or what? That was propane. That was propane. He's standing by the grill. Somebody lights the grill and they didn't quite do it right. And when the resulting explosion blew you, what, 10 feet away? And he landed on his back out there and he had his face all scorched and everything. The other guy got nasty burns on his arms. Uh, he got to be feeling some pain there. All right, now then, um, technician A says impact sockets have thicker walls than conventional sockets. Technician B says impact sockets have a black oxide finish. Uh, who's right about that? Have you seen impact sockets? You have, haven't you? Yeah, got they got thicker walls, and they also were a black color. Now sometimes that may smooth off and get to where it looks a little different, but basically it's a it's a black socket, you know. Two technicians are discussing the use of typical bench pedestal mounted grinder. That's the one like we got over here. Technician A says is a wire brush wheel can be used to clean threads. Technician B says the grinding stone can be used to clean the threads. Oh, goodness gracious. Yeah, which one's right about that? That's number six. That's A. Um so um Something else that you guys might want to just word to the wise, and I don't know, sometimes I want to smack people that do this kind of thing. Uh, you know these little um, clear uh, shields that goes down on, on the grinder over there? You know, they're supposed to be in front of the wheel so that the doesn't, stuff doesn't hit you in the face when you're grinding. And, you know, I was always tightening those things up and making sure they were like they're supposed to be because all the safety shields need to be in place all over every shop. Uh, but here I went over there one day, and some yo-yo had taken those safety shields and broke them off and laid it through over on the bench. <laughs> I don't know who did that, you know, but that's almost criminal to do something like that. And I had another set of safety shields that were new ones that had never been used in my uh, file drawer in here, and I took those over and put them on there. That's what's on there now. But if they start to get loose, one of the most important things you can do is keep the different parts, a little the support stands and stuff on your, uh, on your grinder, and you're supposed to keep those things tight so that they're not you know, moving around a lot. Um, and really the grinder should be bolted to the floor so that it doesn't walk around too. Um, all right, let me see. Uh, a hydraulic press is being used to separate a bearing from a shaft. What should be used to cover the bearing during uh, this particular operation? Why don't you put a brake drum on it? You know, the brake drum's got a hole in the middle of it. It makes a really nice shield. And if something shatters and explodes while you're doing that pressing operation, 
the brake drum is like a you know armor plate that will keep you know stuff from flying all over the place. In addition to this, now hear this, guys. Even if it doesn't get you, think about pieces of this stuff flying over here and peppering the hood of the Mercedes or the Lincoln that's sitting there, and maybe spider webbing cracks in the glass. You know, even if you get away without being hit, it's no damage damage vehicles that are sitting nearby. You know? Be careful about that because we got a lot of expensive paint jobs and windshields around in here. Have you guys ever seen a windshield break just because of the heat? I mean, I mean, not windshield, but it back windshield of a car, just all of a sudden, for no reason, it just shatters. And uh, we had the one on our little purple car do that about two or three months ago. Somebody came in here and said, hey, that glass is broke out there, you know. And it was, real, it was pretty, pretty hot that day. And they put us another one in there. Uh, kind of expensive. Uh, let me see here. What type of trouble light is recommended for use in the shop? Incandescent, fluorescent, LED, either B or C. That's going to be either B or C. We've got both types out here. Uh, years and years, for years, they used incandescent drop lights. Anybody use one of those? Is that just a regular light? Just a regular, but it's a sort of, a, it looks like a regular light bulb, but it's what you call a rough service bulb. And it's made so that it can be knocked around and it's less likely to, you know, to get blown. What happens if you jiggle a regular light bulb? It'll blow it a lot of the time. Well, these, these rough service bulbs are made so they're not as prone to blow as a regular light bulb. But they get kind of hot. And if you got a, somebody, sometimes people would put a hotter bulb in there that's supposed to be in there because they wanted to have a brighter light. And they leave it laying in there because they're working under the dash. And the next thing you know, that, you know, shield has burns the uh, carpet. Furthermore, it burns you. Now, here's a little story. This guy is working under the hood, and he's got one of those kind of drop lights. And uh, I tell this story every now and then. I think it's funny. Uh, he's working under the hood, and he's working on a little minivan of sorts or some kind of vehicle. The engine was nice and hot and running, uh, but it had a hood prop. The hood was propped up, and he actually took and uh, burned himself on the drop light. And then when he burned himself on the drop light, it caused him to jerk his hand back, and then he knocked the prop rod out from under the hood, and the hood closed on him. <coughs> and so here he is, kicking his feet, yelling for help with the hood closed on him and the engine running. <laughs> now it didn't hurt him. And it was downright comical after everybody found out he was okay. But it was a he, the, what all started at was he burned himself on a drop light. You know the LED and the uh, fluorescent drop lights that we've got are not as bad. You know and all that. You got to respect this guy. He feels lousy and he comes to school anyway. That's a good. That's a good guy. Isn't it? He's going to be a good employee for somebody one day. Comes to school. Some people get a little bit of a headache. They stay home. All of that. But uh, anyway, let me see. When mounting an engine on an engine stand, what grade bolt should be used? Anybody know that? Three or five. Well, five or eight, actually. I knew five was in. Yeah, yeah, five is, you were personally right. Uh, proper care of shop equipment includes doing what? What you got on there? Yeah, B and C, you're basically going to keep it clean and keep it lubricated. Um, some of the times, whenever we don't maintain our shop equipment and it fails all of a sudden, we don't want it to fail in a catastrophic way, you know. Technician A says, uh, changes air compressor oil as a part of routine maintenance. You know what happened down at the diesel department the other day? The air compressor threw a rod. This came apart and the rod came out the side of the little of its little air compressor engine block or whatever you want to call it. So they had to get another compressor. Technician B purges water out of air compressor tanks as a part of routine maintenance. Who's right about that? That's C. Both of them. Both technicians A and B are right about that. So basically changing the air compressor oil. Now why don't we change the oil in our car? And do we need to change the oil in a manual transmission? You change the oil in an automatic transmission. You change the oil in the engine. You don't usually have to change the oil on a manual transmission or in a differential. You can. You don't have to. Uh, whenever I worked at the Mazda dealership back in the early 80s, at 7,500 miles, they wanted us to drain the differential 
and put fresh oil in it, but it was never supposed to be changed again after that on pickup trucks and, and RX-7s and all that. But, um, but basically the air compressor, you're just basically changing that because moisture mixes with the oil and all that kind of thing. Hello, Mr. Weatherford. Air impact wrenches should be used with what? <coughs> <laughs> that's a that's a peculiar question, isn't it? And I think I think it's written bad, or is it? Air compression. What did what, you say the answer was? Would C. C. What about chrome sockets? You're supposed to use chrome sockets with an impact wrench. No. No dry air is the only right answer to that. Dry air. Have you, know, have you ever noticed back here where I got my air compressor, there's a great big old thing. It looks like a, outside, a central heating unit on a house air conditioner. I mean, it's basically it's going, you know what that's for? That dries the air. That's an air dryer. That's why we don't have any water coming out here. There used to be an auto body program over there, and both those big air compressors fed the auto body and the automotive program, uh, that air dryer. See, when you're painting cars, you can't have any water in your air. You know, that's not good stuff. But, um, all right, let me see. Um, which tool is used where there may not be enough room to move a regular wrench? Air what do you think, guys? Everybody like that answer? Air ratchet. You like that? That's a air ratchet. Now, in a lot of the automotive programs that I know about, they won't even let you use air tools. But I encourage my students to use air tools because you need to know how to use them, really, don't you? Oh, okay. Right. Okay, that's fine. You guys, thanks for letting me know. All right. All right. They're gonna take their graduation exam. All right then. Let me see. Uh, anybody else have to take one of those this week? You gotta take one this week sometime. Graduation exam. I don't know. I don't think so. All right. Let me know when you. What day are you gonna take it? Um. What day is Thirty. Okay. Are you scared of it? You afraid you're gonna crash and burn on everything? Probably. Oh, you think you will? That's not good, huh? You gonna pass it? You don't know? Is it gonna be hard? Oh, they, they gonna have algebra on it? Right, algebra, calculus, trigonometry, anything like that on there? Oh, oh okay. All right. Well, if you just make sure that you know your history good enough, you'll be okay. Um, which air tools used to move rust or gaskets? Wooden. Which one? Sorry. Which air tool is used to move rust or gaskets? That's number 14. That's a die grinder, yeah, a die grinder with different attachments on it, right? Most pneumatic grease guns operate with how much air pressure? Pneumatic is, yeah, like you hooked an air to it. 90 PSI, basically. Uh, you were, you were uh, keying off of the original one about the air blower, but uh, 90 PSI is what most air tools are rated to be used at. But... Uh, I saw the other day, I was at Harbor Freight Salvage, and I saw uh, rechargeable, you know these rechargeable drills and all that kind of stuff? I saw a rechargeable grease gun. I mean, a, it had an electric thing on it, rechargeable, and it was about $140. You know, you just pull the trigger and go, you know, squeezes. I mean, I can do this. I mean, I don't know, unless you're going to grease it, it takes lots and lots of grease, like a crane or something. All right. Which metric unit of measure is used for volume measurement? CC, centimeter, millimeter, or meter? Huh? What? For volume measurement. Volume measurement. All right, I always like to quiz everybody on this. That's going to be cubic centimeters, CCs. And basically, uh, how much does a cubic centimeter weigh? Well, we're we're talking we're not talking uh, imperial measurements. We're talking metric. It weighs one gram. Got me. All right, I won't burn this in, guys, because it's important that you understand it. A lot of people don't even think about this stuff. Water is the standard that they use for weight and volume. Okay, a cubic centimeter of water weighs one gram. Okay, let me ask you this: How much does a thousand cubic centimeters of water? Like, if I was going to get a container and I was going to put a thousand cubic centimeters of water in it, what size would that container be? A thousand grams? That's uh, a kilogram, that's weight, but I'm talking about volume. 
Somebody should know the answer to this. You guys see it every day. You hold them in your hand all the time. One liter, right? A thousand cubic centimeters is equal to one liter of water. So, I mean, a thousand cubic centimeters of water is one liter of water. That is, are you getting this now? Are you getting it? Okay, a thousand cubic centimeters as far as weight. So, how much does it, how much does a liter of water weigh? In grams. You just said it, a thousand grams. And so we call that a kilogram, right? Are you familiar with that? You understand where I'm going with that? Okay, now let's go back to imperial measurements. An ounce of water weighs an ounce. Okay? Everybody here? They would have the same word on that one. An ounce of water weighs an ounce. What does 16 ounces of water weigh? A pound. All right, the 16 ounces of oil weigh the same as 16 ounces of water. Yeah. It's lighter. See, I mean, the volume's the same, but the weight's different. See, so water's a standard. What about 16 ounces of something like rice or wheat? It's going to have a different, you know, measurement, too. The, uh, so by, by weight and by volume. What about refrigerant? Refrigerant, if you buy a one-pound can of refrigerant at the park house, how much is in it? They call it a one-pound can of refrigerant. How much refrigerant is in a one-pound can of refrigerant? How much should be in there? Yeah, there should be, but there's a, they call it, but it's like 12 ounces. <laughs> and that's something how they do that to you? They tell you they're selling you a pound of refrigerant, they give you a 12-ounce can. What's up with that? Okay, let me ask you this. How, much, how many gallons are in a barrel of oil? But they talk about oil, so much money per barrel, you know? How many, how many gallons are in one of them kind of barrels? It's normally a 55-gallon drum, man. No, it's 42 gallons. Go, go figure. I'm not sure why that is. I'm sure we'd probably research it and figure it out. Does that thing go in a 55 gallon drum? It does, but I mean, I'm with you. I think it ought to be 55 gallons because a 55 gallon drum is what I'm used to, but a barrel of oil is 42 gallons. And the best grade of oil is actually kind of a clear green color and you can see through it. It ain't all black, you know. All right, let me see here. Uh, let's see, let's see. Where are we at here? Dial indicator can be used to measure what? A, crankshaft end play. B, bore diameter. C, piston ring side clearance. Or D, thickness of the rings. A. That's A. A is the only thing you're going to use that for. And you know that because of the worksheet you did the other day, right? There you go. Which of these objects has a mass of approximately one gram? In other words, it weighs a gram. Small paper clip, very good. So if you got a, think about this, if you've got a thousand paper clips, that's a good trivia question to ask people. You know, ask your teacher at school. If I've got a thousand paper clips, how much does it weigh? In pounds. 2.2 .2 pounds, right? That's, that, is that, you can make those associations, right? You've got to be able to make those associations in order to be, to be smart. And if you, the more you do that, the smarter you'll get, you know. If you don't ever think about anything, like if you ride around listening to that bumping, thumping music all the time, like some, like one of my students out here, when he pulls up, you can hear his windows rattling, and he's rattling everybody else's windows too. You know, and I was telling him the other day, studies have shown that listening to that kind of music dumbs you down and makes you forget a lot of the stuff you need to know. But on the other hand, and I know all of us don't like this, listening to classical music makes you smarter. Actually, it opens up parts of your brain. It really does. It opens up parts of your brain that you would never use ordinarily. You know, and so that's why a lot of times people, there are musicians that are play violins and stuff. Can, and I'm not a big, big fan of classical music, don't get me wrong. But that's what they're, you know, if, if you go to one end of the scale and listen to music that just has this repetitive boop, 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 boop pattern, you get dumber and dumber and dumber and you get to where you can't even really think. I mean, that's actually been proven in some studies that I heard about. But um, anyway, uh, there are how many millimeters in one centimeter? How many millimeters are in a centimeter? No. How much is a centimeter? How many millimeters? A centimeter is 10 millimeters, by, by the way, guys. A 10 millimeter wrench. Think about a 10 millimeter wrench. Uh, that's going to be roughly that's about as big as this. You know, about as wide as that. See that? The width of that? That's about a centimeter. That's about. Now, I hadn't measured it, but it's about, okay? i got to say about because I haven't measured it. Okay. Okay, now the micrometers, micrometers, haha, <laughs> are calibrated using what? Number 20. 
You remember in that set of mics that I had laid out here when you guys were measuring crankshafts and stuff the other day, there was some little pieces of metal that were just laying in there, like little cylindrical rod pieces of metal. All right, they, there's actually in that particular set of mics, there's a one inch one, a two inch one, and a three inch one. Okay, if I take my mic and I dial it out and I put this three, like it's a three inch mic, and I put that in there and I dial it up so that it's, you know, it's touching both sides of that. When I look at that, it ought to be exactly on zero over here. And there is an adjustment you can make on that thimble to make sure that it's reading properly before you start measuring anything. That's why you have to calibrate the micrometers because they have a tendency over time to get off. And once again, when you measure something with a micrometer, you're not using a seat clamp. You don't want to crank that thing down super tight. I've seen people do that. They feel like it's going to be real, real, real tight. And basically, you just want to stop whenever it's touching. For measuring a journal for out of round, what's a journal? Somebody tell me what a journal is. Anybody know? I'm not talking about a thing you write in for your creative writing class. Reach over there behind you on the floor. Weather, perfect. You look pretty strong. Give me that. Hand me that. That thing that's on the floor. What do you call that? What is that? What is it? Bring it to me. Huh? All right. You see them shiny places? Those are journals. Those are journals. Got it? Now that crankshaft has got a bunch of journals. This is a three liter Ford crankshaft. But if you're measuring these journals for out around, basically you're wanting to know, go this way and that way to make sure that they're not egg shaped. If you got an egg shaped journal, you got problems. All right, so all right. I'm gonna lay that right there. Okay, so now let's listen to that again. For measuring a journal out of round, measurement should be taken however ever how many degrees around the journal. That's number 21. What about B, 120? What's 120 degrees? Half a circle. Huh? Half a circle. Wait a minute, how many degrees are there in a circle? All right, uh, how many times will 120 go into that? 120. Yeah. 12 goes into 36 how many times? Twelve goes into thirty-six. How many times? Three. Bingo. Watch. Got that? That's one hundred twenty degrees right there. And that makes three hundred sixty. Got me? All right. All right then. Yeah. You guys, uh, have y'all guys ever figured out the traveling salesman and the ten-dollar bills yet, and all that stuff? You figured out. Did you ever talk to anybody, your teacher, about that? No. You remember that story I told you the other day on the board about the three guys with the ten dollars and all that kind of stuff? Did you just sort of write that off as unsolvable or okay. couldn't figure it out? Yeah. So, did you have trouble with that? Did you have a problem with that? Did you, did you? I will tell you this: if you decide to show that to somebody that's sitting there eating lunch or something, you have to watch out who you show it to. You know why? Because some people get mad. I mean, they will literally get mad at you for showing something. They think you hoodooed them or something. All right, let me go here now. On pushrod engines, what are they talking about? What's a pushrod engine? Y'all don't play dumb with me. What you got? What's a pushrod engine? You know? When do you know? Pushrod engine? Yeah. I asked you first. Isn't that like is that low car? Yeah, what does a pushrod do? Okay, I'm going to draw the crankshaft pulley right here. And then we'll draw the camshaft pulley. All right. Now the crankshaft has got the pistons connected to it. And the pistons are actually going up and down in their cylinders there on the crankshaft. But this is turning a shaft that's got little lobes on it that are egg shaped. And they're pointing this way and that. And all that. And on those lobes, rides, and some little bars, lifters. <laughs> Every one of these has got lifters. All right, there's a rod that's crooked on my drawing, and it goes to a rocker arm, and that rocker arm actually opens and closes the valves. Got it? So you got a rocker arm, push rod, lifter, camshaft. Got it? Everybody got that, right? Yeah. You understand what we're looking at there? Okay, an engine that uses push rods is called a push rod engine. Now, what is the distinction between a push rod engine and one that doesn't use push rods? 
this is part of what you're supposed to know, isn't it? All right, let's go, let's go here. The camshaft with this little egg-shaped lobe, but I can't draw one like I want to. Push rod engines like your old 350 Chevrolet, and overhead cam engine don't have push rod. Now you know what a push rod engine is, right? 350 out of the 98 It is. It is. Now the ones, if it's got overhead cam, like that 4.6 out there that we're swapping out of that F-150, it is not a push rod engine. Now there are 4 liter engines and explorers that are push rod engines and 4 liter engines that are not push rod engines. Uh, the, the push rod engines are the ones with the camshaft and the block. Got it? You know the rocker arms? The, they're actually operated by the push rods, which are driven by the lifter, which is sitting on the camshaft. You understand that? And the rocker arms are there to open and close the valve so that the engine can breathe, because the engine's a big breathing machine anyway. All right, so keep that up. Let's keep. Let's go here. Now, everybody know what a push rod engine is. Can you describe that? Weatherford, what would you say if somebody asked you, what well, if somebody has walked up to you at school and said, what's the difference between a push rod engine and an overhead cam engine? What would you tell them? Were you listening to what I just did up here? you got to be able to put this into words now. Think. Camshaft, lifter, push rod, rocker arm, valve. Right? With overhead cam engine, camshaft, cam follower, valve. There's no push rod there. Because the camshaft is right up right up on the head. Camshaft's in the head, you got no push rods. Camshaft's in the block, you got push rods. Got me? Everybody burn that in, right? If the camshaft's in the block, you got push rods. If it's in the head, it's not. And a lot of engines have got them in the head now. Got the camshafts in the head. A lot of them. It's overhead cam. Somebody says overhead cam. They also have this dumb saying, overhead valve. Why does Sam Hill they call it that? All the valves are overhead. But if you go to the parts house and you got a four liter, you got to make a distinction between whether it's overhead cam or the other kind. You'll say, they'll say overhead cam or overhead valve. Don't get confused by that. If it's not overhead cam, it's the other kind. Overhead valve is kind of a dumb thing to call it. Um, <coughs> anyway, all right, let me see here. Let me go down here. On push rod engines, camshaft journal diameter uh, often does what going toward the rear of the engine? That's something a lot of people don't know. That's B. It decreases going toward the rear of the engine. What does that mean? The cam bearings in which that camshaft spins are going to get smaller as you go toward the end of the engine on some of them. If you, you open a box of cam bearings, <coughs> You're liable to find out those cam bearings are sequentially numbered, and you're actually something you can't just put them anywhere. You got to put the smaller ones at the back, and you 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 will not be able to hold them in your hand until they're smaller. If you measure the journals on the camshaft, and that's true, on a lot of your old V8s, it's true on Jeep Cherokee, inline sixes, and all that. Do not forget that. Um, of course, if some of you guys, if I say camshaft, and you don't know what I'm talking about when I say camshaft, then you're sort of challenged anyway. Look, I gotta clarify this stuff so you guys don't be don't be dumb. This is the camshaft. Got me? These are the camshaft journals. These are right here. The part that it spins in. Notice this one's got four of them, right? This camshaft actually goes with that crankshaft. You can tell by the length of it, can't you? All right, you see these little lobes on here? These little lobes, that, these little egg-shaped lobes I'm talking about that open your valves. You got that? Now, I'm going to pause for a second and I'll tell you a story. Brand new car. I was working at Lincoln Mercury Place, 1984. Had a brand new car, came off the convoy, had an engine skip. Bup, 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 bup. Skip it on number three, I think, I don't know what it was. And I was, just, I was just a line mechanic back then, but I was also doing some transmission work and some other kind of stuff and working on electronic engine control stuff and blah, blah, blah. You know, they hired me because a lot of the guys didn't want to fool front and wheel drive cars and didn't want to do electronics and didn't want to do transmissions. Anyway, so the guys on the other side of the shop, the old mechanics that had been working there for years and years and knew a heck of a lot more than I did at the time, they said they checked everything they could check on that engine to find out why it was skipping on number three. And this was a brand new engine right off the truck now. you got to remember that. Brand new car. And they decided the camshaft was the problem. And I said, hmm, that's interesting. Well, lo and behold, they threw it over at me. And they said, put a camshaft in this car. Okay, now, what do you got to do to put a camshaft in an old V8? Like that 350 on the stand hour. Did it pull it out? No, it didn't pull it out. You can do it in the car. But 
You do have to pull the intake. You got to pull the rocker. You got to loosen your rocker arm and pull them off and get them out of the way. Get the push rods out of there. You got to get the lifters out of there. You got to pull the timing cover off. You got to pull the timing chain off. You got to take the top and the front off the motor. And then you pull this camshaft out of there. Pull this camshaft out of there. I'm looking at it. They got another camshaft from the park store. Perfect Circle brand. They didn't get one from Ford. They just got one from down the street that would fit a 302. And so I'm holding this thing, looking at it, next to that new camshaft, and I'm looking at the lobes. For some I can't see anything wrong with them. I can't see where they're ground wrong. I can't see where they're indexed wrong. I cannot see what's wrong with that camshaft. It looks like a really good camshaft. And I'm thinking, they just sold me a bill of goods. I'm wasting my time. I'm going to put this camshaft in here. I'm going to be done all that. Of course, I get paid under warranty for it. Well, I put that perfect circle camshaft in that motor, and it ran just as smooth. I have never been able to figure out, to begin with, <laughs> what the Sam Hill was wrong with that camshaft, and secondly, how they knew that's what the problem was. Was it something that small you could tell? Yeah, had to be. I mean, but I was look, I was holding it in my hand, just like this, and I was looking at it, and I said, I wonder, you know, what it is that's causing this to do that. But anyway... This is a camshaft, these are the lobes. This gear right here actually turns the distributor and the oil pump. And these journals are not the same size at the back as they are at the front. Now this is the back, you know, that's where that gear there is, and this is the front. You can see where the cam gear goes. This is a cam gear for a newer vehicle, like a F54 and an F-Series. It's got variable cam timing. See, it's got that thing in there. All right, now then. All right, the camshaft. So you know you know what cam journals are, right? You know what a crankshaft is, you know what a camshaft is, you know what cam journals are. I have to stop sometimes and make sure that you guys understand what I'm talking about because there's some things I've known so long I think everybody knows them. Uh, let me see. On push rod engines, let me see. Never mind, I've already done that one. A telescopic gauge is used with what other measurement tool? Now, you all used one of those the other day, didn't you? You know the one that snaps out against the cylinder walls, you lock it down, then you measure it with something? What is it? What do you measure it with? Do you measure it with a straight edge, a feeler gauge, a micrometer, or none of these? You guys remember that? That T-shaped thing that snaps out against the cylinder walls? That's a telescopic gauge. Now what do you what do you measure that with after you took your measurement? Micrometer. Huh? Micrometer. Micrometer, yeah. Can everybody say micrometer? Weatherford? Say micrometer. Hollinghead, say micrometer. My, micrometer, micrometer, can you say micrometer? Micrometer. And if, if you read it, he was reading it phonetically, and that's pretty good, you know, because it means he learned phonics in school. Uh, he says micrometer, you know, and that's, I read, I read it like that while I go to myself. You know, so when I first saw it, that's what pops out. Okay, don't get crossed up on that. How, is, how do you spell, uh, like if I'm going to stop my car, I'm going to put my foot on what, which pedal? Right. How do you spell that? B-R-A-K-E. There you go. But do you know a lot of newspaper articles that have a B-R-E-A-K? He knows that. I mean, people that write newspaper articles will spell it wrong. I don't get that. Spell check didn't catch it, did it? All right. Let me see. Let me come on down here. Cylinder, taper, and out of round should be measured where? Cylinder, taper, and out of round should be measured A, near the bottom of piston travel, B, uh, just below the ridge, C, both A and B, and D, neither near me. What in the world does just below the ridge mean? What are you talking about there? On your old engines, because you had high tension piston rings, at the top of the cylinder, you know, if you looked in there, you would see a place, the place where the ring stopped, there would be a ridge there. And that ridge would be worse right behind the water pump on the front of the motor. I will tell you this, with these low tension piston rings that they got in there now to have, because the pistons have less drag, uh, you, I haven't seen a ridge in a, in a cylinder in years and years and years. One of the things I'm supposed to teach in engine repair is how to remove a ridge. The problem is I don't have a lot of ridges to show people how to remove because once you've removed a ridge, the ridge is gone. And there ain't no ridges. We don't have ridges anymore. We used to have on the older engines, but ridges are gone now. You tear apart a new engine, you don't see no ridge no more. They're going away. Um, and I'm talking about high mileage engines, too. What's the most amount of miles that you've personally known of a car having on it? 400,000. But you pour that one down, and you might see a little bit of a ridge, you might not, depending on what it was. What kind of vehicle was it? I can't remember. This guy told me about he ran 400,000 old car he had, and that's all he got out of it. Yeah. Well, there was a guy that I knew one time that worked with me, and he told me that uh, 
He didn't know anything about vehicles, but he was really fastidious about keeping them maintained. He had a Chevrolet or a GMC that was like a 74 model. And he was changing the oil in it, you know, every 1,500 miles, I eventually found out. Well, he told me one day when he came out, he said, my camshaft, I mean, my uh, timing chain broke on my truck and it bent all the valves. And I had, had the heads pulled off and, you know, a bunch of valves replaced and valve job done and all that. cost me $450. And this was way back in the, you know, late 70s. And I said, good grief. And so I said, how many miles did I have on I heard a timing chain breaking on a 350 Chevrolet. He said, well, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? He said, well, speedometer quit working at 385,000. Yeah. And I said, really? When was that? And he goes, oh, it was about four or five years ago. Good grief. And I said, uh, so, and I went, but he changed all over 1,500 miles. And because he changed it over 1,500 miles, he got a phenomenal out of mile mileage out of that thing. See what I mean? You change the oil more regularly. Did you know this? This is an important little piece of engine information. If you run your car a quart low, the oil breaks down in 1,500 miles. Did you know that? One quart low will cause the oil to break down twice as fast as if you got the right amount of oil in it. Like a, if you're supposed to have five quarts and you're running four. Now that comes from Ford Motor Company. They're saying if you're running an engine a quart low, it's going to break down in half the time. So just keep that in mind. You know, Here's something else a lot of people don't know that I got reading old TS about these. When you're driving 65 miles an hour, you got 40% more wind drag than you do at 55. That's why gas mileage is so much better at 55 than it is at 65. You know. All right. So, all right. That's a little bit of uh, trivia that you can take somewhere if you want to. I don't know what you're gonna do with that information, but there it is. Except maybe drive 55 when you don't want to burn a lot of gas. Uh, let's see. Um, cylinder taper and out around should be measured right below the ridge. Yep, that's the point. A telescopic gauge can be used to measure what? A, camshaft bearing out of round. B, housing bore out of round. C, cylinder bore taper. Or D, any of these. And it is any of these. That's for that's that. To read a dial caliper, blank, the reading. In other words, you add, subtract, add, multiply, or what? Uh, on the dial to the reading on the blade. I've showed you guys that. You add it, don't you? All right, so you guys ought to know how to do that. All right. We got just a few more questions left. 27, the best tool to measure clearance between two components is uh, what? A, feeler gauge. B, caliper. C, micrometer. The clearance between two components. There's going to be a feeler gauge. gauge, yeah. Which tool is necessary to measure flatness of engine components? Like the heads and engine blocks. You used it the other day, guys. What is Straight it? Edge. Straight edge. There you go. Well, both A and B, actually, uh, would be C. Put that down there. A dial indicator may be mounted by what? Magnetic mount, threaded rod, clamp mount, or any of these? Any of these, right? Which tool is used to measure valve lift? A, dial indicator, B, micrometer, D, C, caliper, or D, any of these? Um, dial, dial indicator. There you go. That's smart, guys. Which of these is the best tool to measure cylinder bore taper and out around of the ones that are listed here? Let's take a, uh, on that one there, let's call that a dial bore gauge. Because the dial bore gauge has actually got, you know, three little fingers sticking out this way and one out the other way. I got one around there. And when you set it up for the, you know, where it'll measure the size cylinder you're doing, all you got to do is pull it over there and you get your little reading. It's real slick. Now, I'm going to do something really quick while y'all are still here before y'all leaves. I'm going to turn my camera around. I'm going to point it over there. All right? I'm going to point it over there. No All right, Weatherford, move your head. Because this thing needs to be able to look at that board. All right, this little board right here is a fairly cool little board. <laughs> and it's basically an electrical board. Now, Mercer did this earlier. Okay, now our objective on this board right here is to make this light spin one way when we push that button, and the other way when we push that button. You got me? So anytime I'm going to hook anything up, you guys get your, you got to look at it second hand on that watch and see how long it takes me to do this. Hopefully I won't have any bad jumper wires. If I got bad jumper wires, it's bad. Tell me when to go. Uh, you going to time me? Yeah, I won't time me. Tell me when to go. Look at that, that, that second hand on that. You got it on that stopwatch. Well, you got it on your stopwatch. You ready? Go. Go. Okay. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ground everything that I know needs to be grounded. Right. Like I say, if I got a bad jumper wire, I'm going to be embarrassed. Power up everything I need to be powered up. Okay, I'm gonna have to 
how the rounding my normally closed and rounding my uh, coils, basically. Now you can daisy chain these coils together. The only problem is if you've got one bad jumper wire, it can kill that whole daisy chain. Now be careful about that. All right, that will power up the stuff that's supposed to be powered up, which is actually going to be here and here. I want you guys to be able to do this just because it's fun for you. You know, if you try to do something and you crash and burn it, it's any fun, is it? It's just not fun. All right, and I'm going to do something. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to daisy chain this right here and this right here. The reason I'm doing that, I'm going to power up one side of each button. You got me? Like I say, if I got one bad jumper wire, I'm going to pay for this. And then my control wires are coming back in. I'm going to make those, put those over here to this. Whenever somebody learns how to do this, I'll come in here and find them doing it over and over just because they enjoy doing it. That's the coil. All right, we're going to make sure our coils work. Uh-oh, we've got a problem. Throw me that test line. All right, I heard a coil click when I matched this one. Hear it? I don't hear the one over there. I know i got issues. I also know that I'm supposed to have power here. See that? Okay, that's working. That's a bad connection. All right, there we go. Now the last connection I'm going to hook up. Who knows what I need to do last? The power. Right? No, what do you mean nothing? We can't. I know the power. Take a right amateur. All right. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to take this one right here. Hook it there. And I'm going to hook it up here. And then I'm going to go. Right. It goes left and then it goes right. Yeah, you know why that happens. The reason that happens is because right now, if you measure it, like this, this is your own power, one does or anything else. Let's look over here to power. What am I going to read when I touch this? My ground. My ground. You got me? All right, now watch what happens. See that goes away? And what's there now? All right, Let's see what's there now. See that? How does the power all of a sudden appear in here? What do you think? Okay, so if I go that way, then I go that way. What happens if I push them both? They will blow a fuse? No, they're both high. And whenever the, there's no differential, they can't blow. So you got that. All right. So your job is to be able to, by the time you end this semester, you should be able to do this with your eyes closed. Got it? All right. All right. All right. Okay, 10 minutes and 18 seconds. Yeah. Now you guys put those sheets with your name on them and that thing is that corresponds with your name so that uh, Katie can do what you do. Yeah.